chapter 23. <clears throat> All right, Proverbs chapter 23, and I'll ask you to read along with me as I read out loud. You read silently. Verse number 4 of Proverbs chapter 23. Here's what he says. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, the deceitfulness of riches a little bit and uh, the role of wealth in the life of a child of God. And I hope we'll all be tuned in and, and uh, be thoughtful about this and hear what God has for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless your word tonight. I pray that you would have liberty to, to speak to each and every one of us. And God, uh, may we be willing to do some self-examination on this to make sure that our heart is in the right place, that our thinking is in line with your word about this. And God, we thank you for what you do accomplish in our hearts and our lives through your word. Uh, Lord, all until we see you face to face. And Lord, we, it is our desire when we see you face to face, Lord, to be able to hear that, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Lord, it's in times like these that, uh, Lord, you mold us, you shape us, you correct us uh, to make that possible. So I pray that we'd give attention uh, to your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what he says pretty clearly here in the verse. Labor not. Now we can't stop right there, can we? Because if we, if we just pull those two words out and try to just preach on those, then we violate other scripture. We know that's not all he says there. Because we know we are supposed to be workers. Raise your hand if you know that God made us to be workers. All right. We're supposed to be productive people. That's what God wants us to be. He wants every one of us to be productive people for ourselves and for others and society as a whole. So we can't just stop at labor not. And we can't put other words in here. We, we can't say labor not to provide for your house. Because that would be a violation of Scripture. Uh, we know that's a biblical principle. That we are supposed to be providers. Especially the men. I'm talking to us. Uh, that we're supposed to, uh, in particular, be laborers, but women uh, are laborers too in the house. No one can read about the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 and come away with any idea other than that's a worker right there. Uh, she's, uh, she's a working lady for the production of her house and the help of her husband. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4, though, says, Labor not to be rich. There's where we get the not from. Labor not for this purpose. Do not labor to be a rich person. Do not labor to be a wealthy person. Now he's going to go ahead and explain why, but first he has to encourage us to let go of our own wisdom in this matter. He says, cease from thine own wisdom. Why, why does he have to say that? Because it's a natural thought to everyone who lives on earth that if we just had more money, life would be better. Am I telling the lie there or am I telling the truth? That's a natural thought, isn't it? That if we just have enough money, then life is okay. Now, the problem with that thinking is that is not biblical wisdom. That's not God's wisdom. God doesn't care about money near as much as human beings do. God's not fascinated by money. Uh, he's not, uh, he's not uh, 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 prideful about money or anything like that. that that's one thing that, that God convicted me of years ago um, when... Uh, you know, when somebody's going to preach about heaven, and I'm sure, I don't remember an exact time, but I'm sure I've done this too. Uh, we don't have a lot of information in the Bible about heaven. And uh, actually, God has more in the Word to say about hell than He does about heaven. 
And the details that most people uh, ascribe to heaven are actually details out of the book of Revelation that are description of the new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven and be in the new heaven and the new earth. And here's what a lot of people want to elaborate on. Well, don't you know that it's, it's walls of jasper? It's gates of pearl? There's a street of gold so pure that it's actually transparent. It's clear, but it's, but it's gold. And if we're not careful, we start looking at heaven in monetary value. Like, man, this place must have cost a lot of money to build. Well, God doesn't care about money. God doesn't need money. Um, now, you and I do. And there's a biblical understanding of that. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, uh, they're wanting us to pay taxes, He didn't say, uh, you're my people, you're my children, uh, we don't care about money, forget about that. That's not what He said. He told them to pay their taxes. And he told, them to go, he told them to go fishing, which was their employment, before he called them. He told them to go fishing to find the money to pay their taxes. And so, uh, and, and so uh, God, God's not, uh, he's not uh, mixed up about that. And there's a, there's, a, there, there's a necessity of resources and means, but there's a difference between laboring for provision... And laboring, listen, to be rich. There's, there's a difference. And that difference is in our outlook. And that's why he says, cease uh, from thine own wisdom. Then he said in verse number 5, he said, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? Now to set your eyes upon something means to focus on it or be desirous of it. He said, look, are you going to put all your focus on something that's not even there? What do you mean it's not there? Well, because it's a, it's a fleeting idea. It's a fleeting idea. In just a minute, we're going to look over in the New Testament. And in a New Testament verse, the word that we have riches comes from the Greek word plutos. Now that doesn't necessarily mean anything to you and me except this. Uh, the word plutos in the Greek is where we get our word pluto. And I find that interesting for this reason. That in my lifetime, Pluto has been the planet that is farthest away from where I am. And sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a planet and sometimes it's not. Have you noticed that? I don't even know what it is right now. Does anybody know? Is it a planet or is it not? It's not? Because, it, I'm serious, at least three times in my lifetime it's gone back and forth. Well, Pluto's the ninth planet. Uh, well, actually, no, it's not a planet. Uh, and then somebody said, well, yes, we've discovered again that it is a planet. Now, look, if there is a connection, I'd say that's an amazing coincidence that the word for riches are like Pluto. Sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not. And they seem to be the hardest thing to reach. They're the farthest away from actually attaining to or, or, or getting there. I'm just going to tell you, if you spend your time, resources, and energy working to be a rich person, you're wasting your life. There are far greater things to invest your life in than just being able to reach a dollar amount and say in your own heart, okay, I'm there. Because you know what? It's a very subjective thing. What is that dollar amount? Did, did, you, know, did you know that four years ago, somebody at a, at a certain amount of money in the bank or investment or whatever, four years ago, somebody could have had a certain amount Four years later, if they had that same amount, they might not be considered rich. And do you know why? Things are changing. I was just talking with a missionary from Mexico, and he, he's at home right now. He's reporting to churches. He's looking to visit a few new churches and maybe try to raise some more support. And, and, and he told me why. He said, that, he said, amazingly, the dollar has actually been pretty, pretty uh, uh, stable 
But he's in Mexico, and he said, I don't know if you've read about this or heard about this, but there, there's something they're calling right now the super peso. And what has happened is in a very short period of time, the, while the American dollar has stayed relatively the same, the, the value of the peso has skyrocketed so that now the support that this, this couple was getting for their ministry in American dollars is now about 75% of what it was before the super peso. And this is how economies work. This is how, this is how money works. It ebbs, it flows, values go up and down. Uh, we're not on a gold standard anymore. We're on an IOU standard. Am I, am I making that up or is that the truth? Somebody says, well, we got Fort Knox over there. I'm telling you, all the gold in Fort Knox couldn't make good on all of the paper dollars that are printed by the United States Treasury Department. And we're printing more all the time. Do you understand how foolish it is to labor and invest your entire life in pursuit of that? Something that is absolutely unattainable. You say, I don't know. I see people attaining it and they seem like they're having a good time. Here's the key word in that statement, seem. What the devil doesn't want you to see, what the world doesn't want you to see, is there's a whole lot of unhappy rich people. There's a lot of people that have a whole lot of money and nothing else in their life. They've lost relationships. They've lost family. They've had to step on everybody in their way to get to, to where they're going. Look, being rich is not a sin. It's not an indictment. But even Jesus warned that there's some things that are almost impossible for rich people. And the reason is because it affects how we think, how we feel, and how we make decisions in life. Here, here's an example of what I'm talking about. And I, I, I hope I'm not preaching to anybody in here tonight. That'd be awesome if I wasn't. But on the chance that I am, here goes. We ready? A person's wealth is not a measure of your value. How much money you have is not a measure of your value as an individual. Do, do you realize Jesus made this statement? So I, I would say it's true. He said, the poor ye have with you always. Now we, watch, we could read the Gospels and watch His ministry. He cared about the poor, didn't He? And He loved the poor. And He sought to help the poor. He didn't always lift them out of poverty, but He was there to help them in their, in their temporal lack of resources. And we as children of God need to have the same attentive nature to the needs of others and the willingness to help those who have legitimate need around us. But it is a fact of certainty that there's always going to be poor people. And poor people are not of less value than people who have means. That's a fact. And I'm talking about you. Now, now, only you and God can know this. But there might be somebody in here tonight who has insecurities in their own life based upon the fact that they don't have as much money as other people do. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but who are these other people? We always, a lot of times we compare ourselves with other people and it's not even really concrete. It's more an ideology that we're comparing ourselves to and might not even be reality. You say, well, I, okay, for instance, I'm talking about my neighbors. I see the house they live in. I see the car they drive. I see all the toys they have in the backyard. I see this. I see that. What you might not see is how high their debt level is. If you did simple mathematics, you might find out you got more money than they do. All it would take is for some creditors to call it due. Anybody understand what I'm saying? 
I'm saying there are still prophets of Baal saying go and prosper to people who don't have the means to do so. And they're plastic and they're about that big. There's a, there's a, a legislation trying to be passed right now in the state of Missouri that requires in the state of Missouri that credit card, uh, the credit card APR has to be limited to, I think, 23% and can't be raised higher. And that's in an effort to keep the credit card companies from doing what they've been doing, which is raise that rate higher and higher and higher. I'm not going to go into the economics of 23% APR, but let me just tell you, you get any kind of balance on that card at all, you're going to have a very difficult time getting out from under that. It's a scary thing. It is. It has ruined a lot of people. I have personally counseled with people in sixty to eighty thousand dollars of credit card debt and saying, I don't know what to do. My minimum payments are over a thousand dollars a month. I could go work two or three jobs and still not be able to come up with what it would take just to make my payments. Then the only thing you can do at that point is either ask for forgiveness, and let me just tell you how I feel about that as a child of God. I don't think that's right to go buy a bunch of stuff and then ask the credit card company to forgive that debt for you. I, just like I don't, think it's, I don't think it's right to uh, take on a lot of debt to go get a degree and then expect the government to pay off that debt for you either. I'm just being honest. You sign the paper saying that six months after you graduate, the payments are going to start being made. And, and now you really shouldn't complain and cry because you've got this debt. You signed the paper. You knew it was coming. Um, it, it doesn't make any difference that somebody on a political scene is trying to be a big hero. Somebody's got to pay the bill. So debt is an astronomical problem. So there are those that are wealthy and there's those that just try to look wealthy. But those that try to look wealthy trip up those who equate their own value with wealth. It's a slippery slope. It's a difficult process. Here, here, here's a, the second thing we ought to examine. Do we... Do we measure other people's value by wealth? It's, it's bad to measure our own value by wealth. It's bad to go through life with insecurities of what people think about you because you don't have as much money as other people. You need to understand something. Your value is in God. Your value is in being a creative work in the image of God and God loves you if you don't have two nickels to rub together. And you have something to offer life, even if you don't have any money. That's a fact. So, so let's, get that, let's get that settled right now. But then let me ask the next question, that is, do you measure other people by how much money they have? Do we sidestep the poor because they're poor? Do we overlook people because they're not in the same bracket as we are? Do we make assumptions about people based upon their appearance? Because I'll just tell you, God's Word has something to say about this, and it's found in the book of James chapter 2. If you wouldn't mind, I don't want you to take my word for it. I want to read it with you. James chapter 2. James chapter 2 says in verse number 1, I'm going to start reading and, and you can get there and follow along. James chapter 2 verse 1, My brethren, have not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. Would you look up here for just a second? Somebody that stinks. Vile raiment means dirty clothes. 
There's a, there's a, there's a stench <laughs> about it. I've had people out here on the porch that I've invited to come in say, no, I, I'm not going to do that. I've been wearing these clothes for over a week and I, I really stink. I can't tell you what a blessing it's been as a pastor to say, you come right on in here and nobody's going to say anything to you about it. And by the way, if you're ever tempted to say something to somebody about it, don't. It's, that's, not, that's not what we're here about. We, we've got to make sure that we're looking a lot deeper than how clean somebody is on the outside in their clothes to see a soul that God loves, that Christ died for, and that if they're, gonna, if they're willing to come in and they're of their right mind and they're willing to behave themselves in a, servant, in a service, there's no reason why they can't sit right here in these seats. No, no reason whatsoever. But he said, for if there come into your assembly a man with gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Gay clothing, by the way, just means he's happily dressed. He's, he's uh, fashionable, is what it means. And say unto him, sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, stand. Do you see the difference here? It's not just location, but it's like, here you can have a seat, you have to stand. He says, sit thou here in a good place and say to the poor, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. In other words, you got two options. You can stand in the back or you can sit on the floor. He says, if you give those options, are ye not then partial in yourselves? In other words, he's pointing out here, that came from you, that didn't come from God. That, didn't, that, that, ide, that ideology didn't come from the Holy Spirit of God. You're partial in yourselves. He says, are ye not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? He says, hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath uh, promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. That's a, that's a horrible indictment that he gives there. That's somebody that's looking too much at riches and wealth and making determinations about that. But let me tell you something. As sure as your value is not determined by how much money you have, neither is anyone else's. People have value because they're loved by God. And that ought to be our value system as well. Last thing I want to ask you about in regards to this tonight is uh, there's a, there's the value of ourselves, the value of others. I want to ask us about this too. Don't you think riches make a horrible object of trust? That's a horrible object of faith, isn't it? To put your trust in money? To put your trust in riches? Um, in late 2007, there were people that saw some signs in the stock market, in the investment market, of some things that were uh, not going very well. And uh, so there was a whole lot of people that started looking for the most stable thing that could ever be that they could invest their money in. They, know they, they knew they would take a dip in the risk and the return, but it would be stable. What was stable? Like what, what was rock solid and and wasn't going anywhere. Well, how about government-backed housing bonds? In the history of government-backed housing bonds, they had never dipped at all. They'd never wavered. I'm talking about Fannie Mae. You might have heard those words. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, rock solid. So there were people who were smart investors who took their money and lumped it all into Fannie Mae and bought as many government-backed housing bonds as I could. What a lot of people didn't see, what most people didn't see, 
was that the housing market was riding on a huge bubble that was about to pop. Here, here's what created the bubble. What created the bubble was frivolous lending that there was not enough capital in the market to possibly ever pay back. In other words, people who should have never been given loans and didn't have the credentials to have loans for something as large as a house were being handed the money. And the, the sentiment of a lot of these people was, even if I live in this house, in this neighborhood, for three to six months before I default on my loan and am evicted, then at least I got to live there for six months. And this is what had inflated the bubble of the housing market. So when enough people defaulted on their loans, the problem became evident and the housing market crashed. But a lot of you know this, not just the housing market crashed. The housing market brought down the entire stock market. Meaning this, that a sweet lady who had worked her entire life and put money into a matching 401k and was at a comfortable retirement level, all of a sudden she had a fourth to half of the capital in that fund that she did before the crash of 2008. Do you know what the government did to the people responsible for the bad lending and all of that kind of stuff? They slapped them on the wrist, sent them out the door, and by mid-2009, some of the same products were already flooding the market again with bad lending practices and and no credit, no problem type loans and all this kind of stuff. Let me just tell you, putting your trust in money is a horrible idea. For a couple reasons. Please hear me carefully. Whatever you trust, the argument can be made that is your God. Whatever or whoever your faith is in, I'm just saying the argument can be made that is your God. Therefore, that is who you serve. And money makes a horrible God. And servants of money are not happy people. They're slaved people. Servants of God are happy. Servants of God are free. Servants of God are trusting God, <laughs> meaning that regardless of how much money I have, God's promised to take care of me. God's promised to meet my needs. God, God's promised to deal with me as a child. God is what enabled David to say, I have been young and now I'm old and I've yet to see the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. You know why? Because God takes care of His own. And He doesn't leave when the going gets rough. And He doesn't leave when there's problems. And He doesn't leave when the clouds get dark. And we just sang some songs about this. He doesn't just walk away. But what about money? Well, didn't our psalm, our, our, our proverb tonight, didn't it say that money grows wings <laughs> and it flies away like an eagle into heaven? Imagine this, because he sets up this imagery. I think, he, I think he wants us to imagine what this looks like. Going, going, gone. Gone. <laughs> Do you know an eagle is one of the only birds that can fly so high they go completely out of sight? And, and if you're just imagining that, you see that eagle just mount up on those wings and, man, he's getting smaller. And he's getting smaller. Where'd he go? He's gone. Now think about that imagery and then think about this. That's what money does. That's what riches do. One day they're there, but I'm going to tell you, be foolish to put your trust in them because they have a way of growing wings and flying away. Let's look at one passage in the New Testament 
and we're going to be done tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> verse number 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 17. Charge them, this is Paul to Timothy as a young pastor, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Anybody know what high-minded means? Arrogant. That's what the word literally means. That they be not high-minded or arrogant, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. A lot of our pursuit of riches comes back to the age-old garden idea when God said, you can have of every tree of the garden except for one. That sounds pretty rich, doesn't it? And the devil comes along and says, have, have, has God said that you cannot eat of every tree in the garden? And he paints it all negative going, now look, you're rich, but you're not as rich as you could be. God's holding out on you. So Paul tells Timothy to charge them not to be arrogant, nor trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good and that they be rich in good works, ready to pardon me, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against what? The time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. This phrase, lay hold on eternal life, is a wonderful statement that just means this, that we're more in tune with eternity than we are the temporal things. If you want some confirmation of that, go read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the end of the chapter. We're not supposed to look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, they pass away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. And if we would start looking at wealth, riches, and money as a commodity to be used for eternity, and not as something to gain to ourselves here on earth and make a difference in our service for the Lord. I'm not even talking about giving. I'm not even talking about, I'm not even talking about missions. It, certainly it intersects with those things. Uh, what I'm saying is, we've got to ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing? Am I laboring to be rich? Do I just, do I just want to be of note in this world as somebody that has means and somebody that has resources? Or do I labor to provide for myself and for any opportunity God brings up for me to do good for His sake and for eternity's sake? Because one's the proper view of money and the other is completely wrong. We need to cease from our own wisdom here and we need to trust the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray that You would help us tonight to be willing to take an inventory in our own.